Being a bit of a science nerd, I've always needed to know what really makes a thing tick. My mom instilled in me the importance of knowing the truth behind the truth. Full disclosure, with my ADD brain, I'd probably gone further down that rabbit hole than she ever imagined, but I digress. <laughs> anyway, not too long ago, I came across several articles written about the recent discoveries about mirror neurons and how important a role they play in virtually everything we think defines us as human beings. The development of language, the passing down of knowledge and skills, and perhaps most importantly, empathy and all manner of social bonds, just to name a few. To oversimplify the mechanics of it, when you observe someone do a thing, a part of your brain fires in the exact same way that theirs does. If you then execute the action yourself or try to, those same neurons fire again. The amazing part is that this mechanic is not limited to actions. If you watch somebody experience something, a part of you will experience it at the same time. Even more profound is that these neurons can be directly stimulated by the weak electromagnetic signals given off by another nearby brain. This means that a tiny bit of information can be directly communicated from one creature to another in proximity to each other. These neurons develop during your first year of life and, as you can imagine, are foundational to both learning and socialization. This is utterly fascinating to me. I work in the entertainment industry, so the concept that people can be emotionally moved by what they see is not some earth-shattering idea. <laughs> but these discoveries about mirror neurons do shine some light on why storytelling is and will always be an integral part of our society. Princess Bride has always been a favorite of mine and a perfect example of the powers of inherent in storytelling. I mean, it must be, right? It is literally a story within a story. Anyway, like many of you, one of my favorite characters is Inigo Montoya. The backstory of his father was what truly won me over. Domingo was an incredible swordsmith who remained unknown because he chose not to work for the wealthy as they would not appreciate his artistry. He made an exception for Count Rugen, a six-figure nobleman who needed a sword that would work for his unique grip. Domingo spent a year creating this masterpiece, but when Rugen returned, he changed the terms and offered one-tenth the agreed-upon price. Domingo refused and instead gave the sword to his son. Angered, Count Rugen killed him. Inigo, only 11 at the time, fought Rugen but was defeated easily and given a scar on each cheek to remember the occasion. Inigo dedicated his life to fencing so that the next time he confronted the six-fingered man, he would not fail. <laughs> and he would say, <clears throat> Hello, <laughs> my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. <laughs> I love this movie, but I remember watching that scene and wondering why the most emotionally engaging conflict in the whole film was reduced to a monologue in someone else's story. I realize now that my life has so many parallels to both Inigo and Domingo that the wrongs done to him actually feel like wrongs done to me. Mm -hmm. Narratively, I feel their pain and root for them to get the justice they deserve. In the real world, I balk at the way their rich journey was reduced to a side plot in a film about someone else. And it gets even more meta than that. You're all watching me tell you a story and about, and about how the scene made me feel. Like right now, right now, a part of you has been creating a possible backstory about my life and why I feel the way I do about it. <laughs> Simultaneously, a part of me is doing the same thing, uh, only about you and how you may feel about what I've said so far. <laughs> and calling attention to it like this is very much like an actor directly addressing the audience during a performance. <laughs> it can make us both uneasy. It's like we live in this dichotomy of needing to be seen, but also being afraid of being seen. Mm -hmm. Because this is science, we cannot truly vet the accuracy of our projections without real world data to compare it to, so here goes. Mm -hmm. My mom's side of the family has always been distrustful of the world and was content to stay in a small Georgia town they were born in. My mom was the exception and wanted more. She saw the lives others outside her community were living and thought, why not me? She moved to Metro DC where she had me and worked as a nurse while attending medical school in her ultimate pursuit of becoming a doctor. Now, if one uses the distance traveled as the measure of success, then this alone was an incredible accomplishment. 
Growing up, she shared a room with five other kids. My grandfather had died in a construction accident, so my grandmother was the sole provider for the family. The house they lived in didn't even have an indoor bathroom. They had an outhouse. <laughs> to make ends meet, my mother and her siblings actually picked cotton at a local farm for $2 a day after school every day. It goes without saying that they had no access to preventative medicine, and my mother had gotten very sick for a while as a child. She didn't know it, but this had done permanent damage to her liver. Fast forward to her working in a hospital in the 70s. This is before they inoculated first responders against blood-borne pathogens. My mom treats a gunshot patient, gets sick, and her story ends very shortly after. The sheer injustice of this event has shaped every part of what I am today. I was eight years old when she died, and she was my entire world, and I was hers. As my uncles and aunts like to say, she spoiled me rotten. I realize now that those years we had together were the only years in my entire life where the story was actually about me. I wasn't merely a tool to add the feels to a story that was about somebody else. I have three loves in my life, music, theater, and martial arts, and they all played a part in helping me endure the life that followed after my mother's passing. Music was a safe harbor I hid in to deal with my pain. Theater pulled me out of my show, and I was drawn to it because it was a chance to live lives that weren't accessible to me in the real world. But it was martial arts that gave me my mojo back. It was a constructive place to channel my pain, and it was the closest thing I found to that beneficent meritocracy I wish existed in the real world. <laughs> There's no plot armor or privilege in combat. The story an observer may want to unfold has no bearing on what actually happens in the ring. You have your preparation and your ability to execute under pressure, and that's it. So it's no surprise that I would come to dedicate so much of my life to it. There is a piece of my backstory. How did your earlier projections about my story differ from reality? <laughs> Given what you've observed so far, I'd wager you can literally feel how I felt watching a an ego get easily defeated by Wesley. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, there are many ways that an ego could have lost that wouldn't have made me feel like this. With his superior wit, he could have cleverly used an ego skill set against him. There are many ways to win a fight uh, when you are objectively outmatched. The film didn't do any of those things. Wesley won because of the plot armor afforded him by true love, and more significantly, because this was never the ego story, uh, an ego story. The narrative, his narrative function was to add feels to the story of how Wesley and Buttercup got together. We have the hardware to relate to each other on a primal level, regardless of our backgrounds. Mandy Patinkin and I have walked vastly different paths through life, yet he, in the role of an ego, told a story that deeply resonated with me. The film remains one of my favorites because an ego ultimately got the justice I never will. No matter how hard I train, I can never physically confront and defeat the forces that took my mother away from me. But through him, I got to experience a little bit of what it would feel like if I could. Writing this piece has really driven home how everything I've done in my life has really been to get back to a semblance of what I shared with my mother. The stories we tell ourselves can be the difference between being destroyed by tragedy or growing stronger in response to it. The story I've told myself is that if I can do enough things, if I can climb enough mountains, I'll finally be worth seeing, worth sticking around for. For reasons I'll let you into it, walking this path has often had the opposite effect. It's clear to me now, if I want to make the most of what time I have left, that I will have to create works where the stories I value are the focus, which is literally what just happened. So, thank you. <laughs>